Okay, this is the third screencast for chapters 14 and 15. So this slide here, we're going to take a look at the idea of how long resources could last based upon how much we're using. So how much recycling goes in uh, to the process is going to really extend out how long that material is going to last. So A, as we're looking at here, we're taking a look at uh, what you know may have been more in the past a throwaway society. So some things, uh, metals just went into landfills. So there's no reason to reuse them because we had plenty to use. Um, using that philosophy, the material is not going to last very long. But as we move more towards a recycle, reduce, reuse, uh, you can see how the the curve begins to flatten out and it'll last longer. But what you do notice all the way along the line is they all have depletion times which pretty much means that you okay no new resources you have to recycle so eventually we're gonna find it all and we have to go back and start recycling more alrighty so uh, one law we haven't mentioned a whole lot of laws as of yet uh, this will be one of the first ones if not uh, the first and it's just the idea is in regards to mining what do they have to do to uh, mining companies have to do to make sure that they are uh, not harming the environment. Uh, inherently they have to do some disturbances to the environment to obtain their product, in this case coal or whatever other metals they're looking for, but according to the law uh, they have to return the land to its original condition that they found it in. And that's a little bit debatable because it's well it's not typically possible you can return to the best condition that you have to return it to. Uh, in other words, these companies, just by nature, they're, they're there to make a profit, and it's not necessarily in their best interest to spend money that they don't have to. So many times it's uh, not the way we necessarily would like it to look uh, when they're done. But the one thing that the, the law does point out is that they need to post bond. In other words, put money aside to start with. Otherwise, sometimes they can go in, get their product, walk away, and say, you know what, uh, we're bankrupt. We can't fix it. Sorry. And then they move on to the next job. Uh, so supposedly, according to this law, they have to put the money up front. Okay. So, what's a better way? What is potentially a better way of doing this? One is to use substitutes that are less harmful to the environment. Uh, so, one thing is we use a lot more plastics today. I'm not sure, you know, overall if that's a better route because they still use petroleum products, but they are lighter and they do use less um, fuels as far as cars go. Uh, recycling is a really big impact. So the more you can recycle, the less you're disturbing the environment to find new materials. So that's a good um, route to go. Another one is using bacteria. And this is one of those, what does nature do, which we'll see here, I think on the next slide. So using bacteria to um, mitigate or reduce sulfates is something that is very helpful. And it also, you know, looking at uh, cyanide ch uh, chemicals, it can help reduce those. But um, all of these type products, it can help reduce some of the impacts. And this is kind of a newer idea as far as looking at ways to limit the amount of pollution that is occurring in the process. So again, looking at this, uh, always having in mind, can we do this differently? Can we do this process with less of an impact on the environment? All right, switching gears. This is chapter 15, I believe, on water, water resources. So uh, this chapter, we're not necessarily going to get into, you know, how do you reduce your water usage so much, just where are they and what is the usage of these materials now. So this first slide here is we're looking at uh, in the Middle East, they don't have a lot of natural fresh water available. Um, take, take a look on here, you see some of the ones listed here, you have the uh, Tigris, the Euphrates, and the Nile, and the, the countries that are dependent upon them. And then you look at these other countries where I don't really see a whole lot of rivers 
flowing around there. So this is a, uh, a difficult location in regards to water usage. So the Jordan River. Uh, you have several countries which are dependent upon it. Uh, you have Israel, Jordan, and Syria. And one of the potential problems is, you know, who owns the majority of it and who's downstream from who. So you see this relationship here with uh, Israel uh, f making threats to Syria because Syria is planning to put in a bunch of dams to slow the water going downstream, increasing their lot of the water and limiting the amount for Jordan and Israel, which of course they needed as well. Uh, looking at another location, you have Turkey sitting in the headwaters, which is mean where the water begins. So Turkey's kind of... All right. So looking at uh, this scenario here with uh, Turkey is that, you know, they're at the headwaters of the uh, Euphrates and they're looking to build up 22 dams along the Euphrates and divert some water over to Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Syria uh, to supply them with water. And you see how Syria gets 90% of their water from the Euphrates. And the potential problem with this is Iraq, who's going to be left with very little water uh, because they're kind of at the end of the line. So they have a problem. Then moving over to the Nile. Uh, typically, historically, you know how Egypt is uh, known as for the Nile. Uh, they are going to have some potential problems based upon uh, other countries which are using it as well. So you see Ethiopia, they control the water. And by the time they are all done using the water, uh, there's not going to be a whole lot left for Egypt. So they're having a, a very rapidly growing population and they need water and they're being very much limited by the actions by countries further down or excuse me upstream so options water wars and uh, we've seen some other videos on this and it's uh, it's an, a, a current or future problem that areas are going to have and it you know it's not something we typically have seen before that actually waging war potentially uh, just for access to water so as you have a larger population you have more and more people that need access to it and there's only so much to go around so some potential fixes to the problem uh, you know some are easier to think about than others. Uh, decreased population, uh, sure, that would be great. Uh, I don't see that necessarily coming anytime soon. We're going to have to, you know, the things we've talked about before as far as lowering the population, it really has a lot to do with poverty and economics. So we really have to focus on that before we can look at uh, lowering a population. But storing water is something that is beneficial for, of course, people in the immediate area. But it's also the efficiency in how you're using the water. So improved efficiency is something that's really going to help. So looking at us, uh, this is the huge benefit that we have here in the United States compared to what we just got done talking about is in these other countries they are all their individual small areas where think about the United States we're much larger than most of what we just got done looking at but the difference is is we are all of course united we're part of the same country so if California has an issue with water uh, you know at least they have some legal actions within the system the United States to discuss this uh, California typically isn't going to go to war with uh, one of its neighboring uh, states uh, there's a system for that. So these other countries don't necessarily have that same mechanism, so they have some difficulties. All right, this is a good place to uh, take a break, and we'll come back and look at some of these uh, slides here and see what we can come up with for the fourth lecture.